Today we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 33. And the title of today's sermon is, God Knows It Grows. God Knows It Grows. In chapter 4 so far of Mark, we have begun with the parable of the sower. We began with the parable of the sower and the seed. And then from there, we transitioned and we learned about the church's call to be, a, I mean, the church's call to shine the light of Christ into the midst of this darkened world. Then we were warned that we have to start being very careful to what we listen to. Now, today, we are going to continue here with two more parables that Jesus told one after the other. So let's begin Mark 4, verse 26. And he was saying, so Jesus was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Lord, as we open up your word today, we pray that you would teach us, Lord, that you would teach us. Father, we ask that you would help me to preach the word as you intend for it to be preached, to not preach things that would be in my own head, but to truly preach what you intend for us today, to hear the truth of your word. Father, help us to be receptive as well, that, our, that we would have ears to hear this morning, Lord, and, and a heart ready to receive, and a will that is ready to obey, Lord, that which you put forth this morning. And let us be changed. Father, we don't come in here to not be changed. We come in here to be changed by your word, to be more renewed into the mind of Christ. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, the parable that we just read is only found in Mark. It's the only one of the four Gospels that has this, par this parable. In Matthew... And people have really said how similar the flow of Matthew and the fl flow of Mark is as Gospels. In Matthew, in this place, we find a similar parable, but in many ways it's quite different. In Matthew, in this place, after talking about a lamp on a hill and all of that, in this place, the light that we discussed last week, in this place, Matthew tells the parable of the wheat and the tares. And the parable of the wheat and the tares, if we were to jump to Matthew, which we're not going to do today, but if we were to jump there, the, the parable of the wheat and the tares establishes a contrast between Christians, and it calls the Christians the, the wheat, and the tares, or the weeds, and those are the children of the devil. So this terrible, the, wheat and the, the parable of the wheat and the tares talks about that Christians and the children of the devil are allowed to grow side by side in the church. Because it's not until Christians begin to bear fruit that the devil's children actually start to stand out. I want to put that thought in an easy way for us to understand. The parable in Matthew teaches that in a church like ours, uh, unbelievers may weekly sit beside believers, and we won't actually know who the believers are and who the unbelievers are until the point comes where the believers start to bear fruit. And as soon as they start to bear fruit, then we see those that are not growing, those that week after week sit and remain unchanged under the Word of God, and we start to suspect at that point, and we have some suspicion that they are the, the weeds or the tares. 
Now, when I started looking at this, my first inclination was to look at the gospel or the parable in Matthew, which is of the wheat and the tares, and then to look at the parable in Mark and to say, well, the parable in Mark is only talking about the wheat. I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's almost like it's a half a parable is what it is. I mean, that's the, that's the initial temptation. But that can't be the case in Mark. It's a totally different parable when you start looking at the two. And the reason is, in Mark, Mark tells us, the parable that Jesus tells here, Jesus tells us that the man sowing the seed does not know how the seed grows. So in Matthew, definitely the person that's growing the seed is God because he knows all things. But in Mark, the person growing the seed is just a man. So it cannot be God because God knows how the seed grows. God knows clearly. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, pretty much every time any of us are together... The seed of God's word is sown into your lives. I mean, every time I'm up in this pulpit, every Wednesday night, uh, this, I am sowing the seed of God's word into your life and into my own life. I mean, yesterday, some members of our fellowship walked the streets of Nashua. They walked those streets with the intent... Their desire was to sow the seed of God's word into people's lives. And even in our own body here, this past week, maybe in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, in a one -on -one situation, people in this church have tried to cast that seed of God's word into the life of others in an attempt to sow the word of God into people's lives. Now from the parable of the sower and the seed that we began this chapter with, we know that a certain percentage of those who hear the seed of God's word, who hear the gospel, a certain percent of those will hear that gospel and they will be saved because the good seed of that word will fall upon the good soil of their hearts and they will be saved. Men, women, boys, girls. We know that a certain percentage will be saved. But what we don't know is how that happens. That's what this parable is kind of talking about today. But God knows. And that's the one thing we can be sure. Even though when we go out in the streets and we share with somebody, or when we're sitting in, our, you know, in a coffee shop and we start telling somebody about Jesus, we don't know what effect that's going to have. We don't know if a plant is going to grow from that, if fruit is going to be produced, but God knows. One of my favorite passages, especially when I get in those moments of discouragement, is one that Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Paul says this. He says, I planted. In other words, I planted the seed of God. Apollos, who was another minister, he watered. In, the, in other words, he kept you know, kept taking care of the Word of God, but God was causing the growth. So that's what Paul sees. You know, we plant the seed, we water the seed, but God is the one that actually brings the growth. Now, I look around our sanctuary at times, and even this morning, and I see what I think is miraculous. I see men and women who have had their hearts changed their minds renewed, many who have been born again just because they heard the gospel preached, either in a one-on-one -on -one situation, or they read it in the Bible, or they read it on a track, or they, or they heard it preached in the midst of an assembly like this. To me, that is miraculous, that God changes hearts through this word. I can think back this morning, just a few years ago, being out on the streets, being up by the library on a Saturday morning, and there was that, and many of you know him, there's this, there was a 20-something atheist that was up there with a sign in his hand and headphones in his ears. And we handed him a tract, just a flyer, and saying, hey, 
come to our church. And two weeks later, he and his brother, who happens to be here today, uh, they came to this church. And shortly thereafter, the father came to this church. And now, just a few years later, you know, oftentimes this church is half full of people related to that young man. <laughs> that one simple invitation to come and hear the gospel and when this heard, things started happening. That is God. That is how God works. We don't understand it. When I went up there that day and handed him a flyer, I would have never suspected that eight, ten family friends even come. I would have never expected that. Two men just walking the streets that morning, handing out flyers, and then God caused that seed that was planted to grow. And to my astonishment, I tell you what, that seed continues to grow. That is the power of God. That is the power of the Word of God. We plant, we water, God causes the growth. Now in verse 29 of Mark, it says this, And when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest is come. That's a difficult verse, I want to say. That's a difficult verse to try to talk about here, especially in the context of Mark. Because it's hard to see how it fits with Mark's parable. That verse is actually a quote, or it's a reference to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 3, verse 13, where it talks about at the end of the age, God in wrath is coming to put his sickle in to purge this world of those who are unrighteous and to punish them in the winepress of God's wrath. And in the parable of the wheat and the tares that is in Matthew, that parable that I mentioned a minute ago, what I didn't tell you is how it ends. In that parable, how it ends is at the end of the age, the church age, Jesus sends out his angels and the first thing that they do is they go throughout the earth and they reap their sickle through the earth and they harvest the tares, the weeds. And it's, they, they harvest the unbelievers from this earth, the children of the devil, they bind them and they throw them into eternal fire. After that, then the angels, Jesus says, will go forth and harvest the Christians, the true believers, and will bring them to heaven. If there's a rapture and you're still left here, it may not be a problem. Because it may have been that verse being fulfilled in the order that Jesus said where the unrighteous were taken first. Just keep that in mind. Don't be, you know, don't be confused at that point. But the parable in Mark is different, remember, because it's a man that's sowing the seed and it's a man that's reaping the harvest here. Now Jesus could be alluding to the end of the age when that harvest will come and the weeds will be separated from the wheat, when the, the goats will be separated <laughs> out from the sheep. But that's probably not what he's talking about because it's a man that's again doing the reaping and of the harvest. So what so what should we glean from this this parable in Mark today? Mark's parable. What should we glean from that? The words of Jesus in this story. I think what we need to glean from that is if, is that we need to just keep on keeping on spreading the word of God. We need to just keep persevering because eventually a harvest is going to come eventually a harvest is going to come. That's an encouraging thought. That the gospel seed, if it is sown upon enough hearts, it will produce fruit. And we will see a harvest. What we see in Mark is an encouraging partnership between God and saints, between those who are believers in Christ. That's all a saint is, somebody that believes in Christ. We're seeing this partnership between God and saints. Saints do their part they go into the ends of the world 
and they, they preach, repent and believe. You know, put your faith in Christ. They, they do their part. They do the preaching. They do the sharing of the gospel. And then God does his part. He causes that word to grow to bring in a harvest. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the fruit, the harvest. And I say glory to Jesus because I like watching him work. I like watching him work. And I like him changing hearts and producing fruit. Now from there, Jesus flows straight into another parable concerning the kingdom of God. And that is Mark, starting at verse 30. And Jesus said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the soil... Though it is smaller than all the other seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. Now, what's that talking about? Think of it this way. We're sinners. We sin against an almighty God. We deserve eternal hell fire because of our sin. Yet God loves us enough that Jesus Christ was punished for our sin in our place so that if we will repent and believe in the work of Jesus Christ alone to save us, then God will forgive us and apply the perfect life of Jesus Christ to our account so that we can be welcome into heaven. What did I just do? I just gave you the gospel in a very small nutshell. That is the seed that we're talking about. That's the mustard seed here that is Planted. It is the gospel. And that seed is really small. It's a small seed. When it's compared to all of the other seeds that are upon that soil. When you think about it, when you go out on those streets or you start talking to a neighbor and you start telling them the gospel, it is going to sound puny to them. It's going to sound small and puny unless the Spirit of God does something to reveal truth to them, it is going to just be something that they want to neglect, they don't want to overlook, because why? On their soil, there are, there are bigger seeds. There are seeds of, of these grand aspirations of men concerning having the most educated of minds, or the most abundant wealth, or being uh, you know, a, a man of stature, a woman's stature in business. Those are bigger seeds compared to this puny gospel. I mean, how... So often overlooked is the seed of the gospel when all the people have filling their minds are these visions that one day I will be recognized in the sports world or I will have popularity in entertainment or I will have notoriety in the sciences. Those things are what men are looking at out on those streets are these bigger things. I want my next beer. I mean, to them, that's a bigger seed than the gospel half the time. I want my next fix. But even though thoughts of damnation and salvation, of hell and heaven, are often far from the minds of men, if that seed of the gospel, that small mustard seed of the gospel, if that is planted, and if God brings that seed growth, then it will change lives and it will push out and dispel all the bigger seeds. I mean, the word of God continues to grow. Even now, even if we don't realize it, that small mustard seed of the Word, the Word of God, it actually grows like a tree and it spreads. You know, at times I think we live in the dark ages in New England. Um, it's a dark age of New England's history that so few know Christ. But the seed of the gospel is growing. It's growing in New England, maybe slowly, but it's growing elsewhere as well. I mean, I thought about this. I was talking to a friend, and he lives in Alabama, and we were talking one day, and he says, he was so surprised. I mentioned that here in New England, churches are being made into condominiums, like around the corner, and, and karate schools. <laughs> and my friend says, well, down here... Gas stations and liquor stores are being made into churches. He says, you can't spit from your porch without hitting a new church. Spoken like a real southern. <laughs> I hope 
that happens up here. I want that seed, that mustard seed of the gospel to spread and to grow, that we would be able to take gas stations and liquor stores and, and you know, bars and stuff and make them into churches. I mean, down south, they can't find land enough to put churches on right now because the gospel is spreading. The mustard seed is just growing into a large tree. A and that's what our desire up here is to have that happen. That's why people walk the streets on a Saturday morning. That's why you all talk to people about the faith in Christ. That's why we try to put the, the gospel message up on the local television station. You know, that type of thing to get the seed out. To get the seed out so that lives might be changed. So that that gospel, the church of God, the kingdom of God might prosper here than here in New England like it once did hundreds of years ago. We may never know which way the wind blows, Jesus says, but it is blowing. And that's the one thing we can be assured of. The gospel is still going forth. Men are still being converted. The harvest is coming in still. <coughs> pretty straightforward parable until we get to the end and it talks about the birds of the air. What's all this birds of the air business? What does that mean? You know, there are three common interpretations that are as follows. Number one, in this parable of the mustard seed, the birds of the air represent society as a whole. How even the unsaved are blessed by the kingdom of God when the church of God thrives in a society. So that's one interpretation of the birds of the air. The second interpretation is the birds of the air represent the Gentiles. That interpretation comes from passages in like Daniel and Ezekiel where the Gentiles are actually referred to as birds that are, are coming in to the flock of Israel. How, how Gentiles are grafted into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. So that's the second interpretation. The third interpretation that's widely held as well is that the birds of the air represent children of the devil because he is the prince of the air, prince of the power of the air. Birds of the air, like those who ate the flesh off of Pharaoh's chief baker in Genesis 40, 19, birds of the air are not always a good thing in scripture. And there are psalms that will tell you that as well. So, which of these three interpretations is true? That's easy. They all three are true. All three are true. That's one of the nice things. People say, well, which interpretation is true? Well, all three are true. The kingdom of God, as it spreads upon across the earth like this mustard tree growing, this mustard seed growing up into a tree, that kingdom of God, as it spreads across the earth through the preaching of the gospel, is a good thing. And it does bless society as a whole. Even those that are unbelievers. Throughout history, we find Christians are often the first ones on the scene to help after a great natural disaster. Christians are often the ones who have pushed for the education of the masses, who have built hospitals, who have built schools, who have, who have taken men from the dark ages into the modern world. You know, people get all over the case of Christianity. How would you like to live in a world governed by Sharia law and Islam? Because you would be living in the dark ages. You look at this, some of these countries. Christianity liberates. Christianity has set women free. Islam, Judaism, they, you know, other religions, they, they take women captive, they suppress them. Christianity has set them free. They are equal. There is no now no male nor female in Christ Jesus. I mean, Christianity has been a great thing. So that interpretation is true. When God blesses his people, a byproduct of that blessing upon his people is that society as a whole is blessed. The number one interpretation is true. Number two is true as well. The kingdom of heaven does encompass Gentiles. They were brought in. For the gospel opens the door of salvation to anyone who is willing to repent and believe. To everyone who repents and believes. The door of salvation is open. Jew and Gentile alike. 
rich and poor, educated and ignorant, black and white, young and old. If you are hearing this word preached today, if you are hearing it over the internet, if you're watching on TV, then you have been invited to repent and believe that you too might share in the kingdom of God. That it might bless you as well. And number three, this is true as well. We saw in the parable of the sower and the seed that three groups were often with the fourth group. They all heard. But yet three groups weren't saved. Only one group was. And in the, if you were to go and read the wheat and the tares, you would see that yes, the wheat and the weeds, the children of God and the children of the devil gather together on Sundays and assemble. And there's another parable in Matthew about the dragnet. The, the, the net that brings in all the fish. And it's very clear that some of those fish are of God and others of the fish are of the devil. And we see the sheep and the goats. It's all throughout scripture. There are two types of people. Those who are saved and unsaved. And what the third interpretation about the birds of the air representing the children of the devil, and that is true too because as the church thrives, the children of the devil actually come into that church as well. That's what the whole wheat, tares, sheep, goats thing is about. So that interpretation is true. On a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, or whenever the church meets, there will be two types of people, quite possibly. The good news is that God knows. God knows. Throughout all of this, there is one truth that we can rely upon and that we can put our faith in. And it's, it's a wonderful, one of the full truths found in Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. I'm going to read it to you. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. This is God making a promise. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. It's a wonderful promise. God says whenever the word goes forth, it's going to produce results. I didn't understand this for a long time. I've been, I'm in my, you know, in, Jul in July it'll be 10 years that I started pastoring here. I didn't understand this a lot at first. But when the Word of God is preached, when Scripture falls on the soil of a man's or a woman's heart, it is going to produce results. It's either going to soften the heart or it's going to harden it, harden it further towards God. God's Word makes some hard against him, and it makes some soft against him. Some that want to fight against him because of that word, and others that want to embrace him because of that word. Some gather with the church week after week, and they are changed from glory to glory. And unfortunately, others will gather week after week, listen to the same sermons, and grow harder as each day passes. Now Mark ends for us today with verses 33 and 34. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. Those verses remind us of something that we learned earlier in Mark, that Jesus taught in parables for a reason. It says earlier in Mark, and it says elsewhere in Scripture, that Jesus was teaching in parables so that only those to whom God had given ears to hear and understand would understand and be saved, 
and those who were not his own would not understand and would not be saved. Deep theological truth we're not going to get into today, but we saw it earlier and we'll see it again. And all that's pointing to is God is the one who is sovereign in salvation. We have to remember that. There is no denying that in Scripture, that for somebody to be saved, God starts the process. No matter what a person does, no matter how much effort they exert, no matter how many times they go to church service, or no matter how many times they claim to believe, unless God converts their soul by opening their understanding to the truth of the Word of God, to the gospel, they are going to die and perish in their sin. It takes God bringing forth the harvest. Now concerning this reality, Paul continues in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read verses 18 through 31 of chapter 1. Go back and read these sometime, but we're going to end with these verses this morning. This is what Paul writes. For the word of the cross, in other words, the gospel, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then he gets really personal. He writes to a church just like this. He says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who because of us, wisdom from God, who because to us, wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. These two parables that we looked at today, they both have one thing in common, and that is that it's not man's efforts. It's God's. God is the one that grows the kingdom. God is the one that brings the fruit. We are to plant the seed. We are to go forth with the message. We are to, to care for that word. But God is the one that brings growth. And the nice thing about both these parables is that that growth comes. There is a harvest and the seed continues to spread. That's what we want to walk away with this morning. And if, and if we do that, then we will go forth here boasting, not in our own actions, but in the Lord. And that is where the boasting belongs. We'll end this morning with that thought that even though we do not understand how the gospel saves souls, nor how Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of God, spreads, we can go out of here with the assurance that God himself knows, and it will continue. So let that be our boast. Let our boast be Jesus. Let's pray. Father, let us go forth from here today continuing faithfully to plant the seeds of your word, the seeds of the gospel, to care for that seed, to, 
to be patient with people, to nourish that seed, Almighty God, to continue to, to bestow upon them the truth of your word, Lord. Let us do that. Let us do our part. And let us do it, Lord, knowing that you are faithful, that you will produce fruit, that you will bring a harvest, and that your church, that the kingdom of God will continue to grow. And Lord, we ask that it grow here in New England in particular, Father, that you would bring forth your kingdom in this city, Lord, that instead of being known as a city where no one is religious, let it be known as the city where people follow Christ. And we ask this, Lord, this is something that is far beyond our ability, far beyond our power, but it is all within your power, Lord. And we pray this, we thank you for this day, we thank you for this service. Again, we lift up uh, Dawn and her mother and her aunt, Lord God.